I was really grateful, um, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, so um, for, forgive me if I am. But I was really pleased to be asked to, to um, assemble this talk because it, it forced me to think about what the term preservation has meant to me over so many years um, and how dramatically that meaning has expanded and changed since I began working in the field in the 1960s early 1960s. As a result of my training in the Philadelphia Office of the National Park Service um, with the Historic American Building Survey and with the Branch of Restorations, I very quickly learned um, that the first step in preservation is documentation. And at that time, that the office was directed by Charles Peterson um, and Lee Nelson and Penny Batchelor and, and others. So it could not have been a better place for, for me to start in the preservation field because they, they were at the top of the game. Um, without understanding, and, and documentation is so important in any preservation project, because without understanding and knowing everything possible about um, a historic building or site or object, it's really impossible to develop a sound rationale and and effective plan for preserving it. And there are lots of questions that, um, that one has to address when, when talking about documentation. First of all, what is it? it? Is it a building? Is it a site? Is, is it a landscape? Is it a bridge? It's a, is it a water tower, an archaeological site? What is it that we're, we're hoping to preserve? What is its significance? Was it a venue for an important historical event? Is it just a great piece of architecture? Or is it a representative piece of architecture, one, one of many that represents a certain kind of building type or function? Um, it, does it represent um, an important advance in technology, like the Gruber Wagon Works? And that was a great project, but you give me way too much credit, <laughs> way, way too much credit. Keystone Hood was, uh, was so great, and, and your firm was so great that I think, if I remember correctly, um, one of the reasons that you were successful in the, in the bidding process is that you, you checked the weather and you knew when the ground froze and when you could move it without a lot of equipment because it had to go quite, quite a distance. And that was, that was a really important part of that. Um, how does this resource, building or whatever it is, relate to other similar resources? Is it unique? Is it rare? Or is it just a representative example of a type of, of resource? What did, the, what did it look like originally? And how, how has it changed over time? And if it has, are the changes significant? Or do the changes compromise the integrity of the original object? How should it be treated? Should it be restored, conserved, adapted, rehabilitated, or all of the above? What function will it serve? Um, how should it be interpreted? Because if we're going to preserve a, a, an object or a building, we need to think about what people can learn from, from that process of, of preservation. The answers to all of these questions and many other questions will provide a basis for developing a treatment philosophy. What, what should we do with this building? Um, I, I, I hope... I'm going to use, since I've been involved in this preservation business since the early 1960s with Charlie Peterson, I'm going to use some of my own personal projects as, as examples because I've traveled um, a route that pretty much parallels the evolution of the term preservation. One of my first projects, and I never get tired of talking about this because it was just an amazing project, is the restoration of a little building on Chester Creek in Delaware County called the Caleb Pusey House. And I'm going to sort of apply the, some of the questions that I just posed a minute ago. This is a very well-documented late 17th century residence of the business partner of William Penn in establishing a milling operation in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's a relatively rare, it's not relatively, it is a very rare surviving example of a building erected by an immigrant from England employing design and construction practices that um, he had learned in England. I don't know whether the light compromises this, but 
I had never worked on a 17th century house anywhere and never worked on an English 17th century house. So I needed to go to England and find out what the people who built this house lived in and what their houses looked like. And that's, so I went to the village of Upper Lambourne in Berkshire and I found the, ha the village that Caleb Pusey came from. And the house that he may have lived in, but certainly in the village that he came from, looks an awful lot like what he built on Chester Creek. Um, it has the same, uh, it has the same materials, stone. <coughs> Brick is mixed in, in with the stone to give it some character and color. Um, the roof is, the roof form is, is very similar. And it was just fascinating. It was a real eye-opener for me because I realized where the tradition came from because I saw the village that it came from. Um, so this, this um, building was acquired by a very dedicated group of residents in Delaware County in the late 1950s. They planned and funded the restoration, planned and funded an extensive archaeological investigation, and they continue to manage the, ha the site today. And it's, it's wonderful because I call them up and I make an appointment and I take my students from Penn down there to, to see it. Thinking about this, this issue of, of treatment philosophy, we, we know what this is, but what, is, what does restore mean when you apply it to this building? Um, does it mean returning it to its original 1682 configuration, which is half of the size of the one that's there now? And the one that's there now has a gambrel roof, but that original one had a gable roof. Uh, in 1696, six is, it was expanded to the left with a, a small utilitarian addition. In 1750, the gambrel roof was added and the building was raised a bit. So, do we pick a historic period and, and restore it to that? If we go to the original period, we tear half the building down. If we go to the second period, 1696, we take the gambrel roof off. But the gambrel roof was a very important part of its documentation. It appears in, in uh, ledgers and, and um, descriptions of, of the property of, of being raised to this wonderful gambrel roof. So, yeah, I think you need to consider all of those alter alternative treatment um, options before landing on, on the right one. And they landed on the right one there, which was to preserve the building to its 1750s appearance, thereby retaining a great deal, most of the original um, historic fabric, original and 18th century historic fabric. Um, many, I, I'm sure you, you're, you, many of you know the, the woodlands or know of the woodlands. Um, this is a, um, a marvelous house in the Woodlands Cemetery. Um, in West Philadelphia. And documentation was the critical first step in deciding the most appropriate treatment for the woodlands. The mansion was constructed and expanded under the direction of William Hamilton over a period of 40 years, beginning in 1770, and extending into the early 19th century. Um, the, the, the project, the current project, is administered by the Woodlands Trust for Historic Preservation. And the first step was to do an incremental historic structure report. And the reason that it was incremental is that there were very serious issues with a facade which needed to be addressed before an, an HSR was done for the entire building. So the incremental report dealt pr primarily with a facade. And what, what the architectural investigations and the um, archival research indicated that this building probably looks something like the upper left-hand corner in the images in, in 1770. And then in 1774, those little um, angular bays were, were added, sym symmetrically added, one, one on each side. Then in 1789, Hamilton had just come back from the grand tour of England, where he had seen the great architecture um, being created there. And he was really inspired. So he expanded his smaller woodlands with the symmetrical wings in, in, in a very high style of, of, of design. And then in 1813, um, by 1813, you see the little yellow um, dot or uh, figure on, on the back. Those are pavilions that were added on top of a fantastic cryptoporticus. Um, 
and stairs, we think, were added around the portico that, that shows in, in yellow. After Hamilton died, um, the, the building became un, under the ownership of the cemetery company, and they, they made some changes. So I guess the, que the, the obvious question is, well, where do we land on a, on a, a treatment philosophy? We certainly don't land on 1770, because we take down so much of the important architecture. But where do we land in, in between? And the decision was really made that William Hamilton was certainly the most important person to ever occupy it and had such a profound impact on its architecture and the style of its architecture that the, the restoration quote or the treatment approach should be to respect um, the building as it evolved through, through his lifetime by, by 1813. Um, there, there are lots of, um, and it, it can't be just as, as cut and dried as that, because if we go to 1813, as a practical matter, we don't know enough about those stairs that wrapped around the portico to put them back, so it would be totally conjectural. From a very practical standpoint, there are vandalism problems in, in, in the cemetery, and what you don't want is an easily accessible, wonderful flight of stairs that comes up into the main parlor. So the decision was made not to put them back, even though we're pretty sure that, that they were there. So the, 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 the lesson learned here is that it's hard to say, OK, 1813, and everything goes back to that, because you probably can't achieve that without some, some conjecture or doing something that you really don't want to do. The next project I'd like to talk about just for a minute is Franklin Court, which, which you all know, and, and I, I think there's a visit there tomorrow. Um, it's it's um, very, very close to here. And it evolved from the early 18th century through the 20th century. In the, very, in the earlier part of the 18th century, there, were, there, were a several, there was a range of very small two and a half story colonial buildings on, on this site. And over time, they, they were enlarged. Franklin, in um, 1785, I think that's the right date, built the two large center sections right there with an with a, um, arch through it. And that's the carriageway, which accessed his uh, personal residence in the, in the court. He started, um, he began building that house in 1763. And the Market Street houses, as, as they're called, were a very important feature to screen his private courtyard garden and house from very busy Market Street. Throughout, when, after Franklin died, the property was sold. These Market Street houses were significantly altered. The front and back facades were torn off. They were raised in height. Floor levels were changed. A lot of the interior, most of the interior features were taken out. Fireplaces, woodwork, and they became commercial buildings, loft buildings. And the, the, so the park acquired this property, knew that this was the site of Franklin's house, and decided to um, un undertake a, a project for the bicentennial to preserve and interpret this site. So the, 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 there are many options here. What, what should they do? That Market Street houses were so totally renovated that was it worth keeping them? The only thing that really survived in the Market Street houses was the party walls that separated the five houses. But on those party walls was an incredible amount of physical evidence showing or explaining what the original houses had looked like, how tall they were, where the woodwork was, where the floor levels, the stairs, the doors, all kinds of things. Um, Franklin's house was torn down. There just wasn't enough uh, architectural or archival evidence to reconstruct it, but there was enough to reconstruct the, the front and back facades of the Market Street houses and adapt them to new, new uses. And so this, is a, this project is a really good example of the combination of conservation in terms of the ruins, of, of the, the archaeological ruins, conservation of evidence of the original houses, rehabilitation, reconstruction, um, and adaptation and interpretation. So this is a, this is a marvelous project, and I, I know you're going to see that um, tomorrow.
I think this is one of the most refreshing and peaceful spaces in Philadelphia. It's just a wonderful court. And, and uh, Venturi and, and Rauch and Scott Brown's ghost structure is certainly a, a, a very it's an iconic image of Franklin Court. The next building I'd like to show you, this is a totally different, I mean, building from anything we've seen. This is Font Hill, as, as you know. It was built by a remarkable man named Henry Chapman Mercer in the early part of the 20th century. And it was part of a collection of three buildings that actually four that he built in Doylestown. The lower one is the, the pottery and tile works, the Meridian pottery and tile works, but the upper one is, is Mercer's own house. This is not, this is a different kind of preservation project because the, the building survived into the 21st century pretty much in the form that, that Mercer originally envisioned it. Um, the building was not subjected to the kinds of physical change often experienced by other historic buildings like Franklin Court. It wasn't added to, it wasn't altered, um, it wasn't upgraded st stylistically, it just plain survived. Um, and one of the reasons it did is because Mercer built it of concrete and reinforced concrete. And although he wasn't an engineer, he had, he had a basic understanding of how concrete and reinforcement worked together. And he created, um, he, he, he developed a method for building these incredible vaults, um, ceiling vaults, by building a scaffolding platform up to the spring point of the vault, putting sand and dirt and covered with canvas on, on, or burlap on top of the mound, and then building the vault over it. And when the masonry cured, he pulled the scaffolding out and he had a vault. But what was really <laughs> amazing to imagine that he put, he cast the tile into the concrete uh, because he placed it on top of this mound of sand and, and soil. And so just, I never go in that building and I'm not totally uh, blown away by what he accomplished there. And I, I kept saying that I had the feeling that I could work for another 100 years and I would never um, be as talented and do so much as Henry Chapman Mercer did. But so the, we think that, that his building was built not only as a residence but also to display his tile work. So here, here, we, here we have the option or, or the, uh, the challenge. What, what, if we, what do we do with this? Well, this is a conservation project. The only real problems were water in infiltration, which, is, which was a result of um, imperfections, originally cast imperfections in, in the concrete, and the roofs, and the window frames, and things like that that could, could deteriorate. But structurally, it was perfectly fine. There was no structural intervention necessary. So really, it was a matter of cleaning off the biological um, um, growth, repairing concrete spalls where the concrete had popped out and was exposing reinforcing material. And by the way, the reinforcing material was anything that happened to be lying around the farm. It could be fence posts, turkey wire, um, real reinforcing bars. Uh, he, he built this himself, and he knew where to put this stuff to, to, to make it work. So it's really a, a marvel. But so it was repairing spalls. It was, it was um, making sure that the balconies didn't leak and that the roofs didn't leak. And it was really basically to keep, keep the water out. So it, that's a conservation um, project, not, not a restoration project. Another very different kind of project is the Majestic Theater in, in Gettysburg. This was opened in 1925 as a vaudeville theater and movie house. And in the 1950s, President Eisenhower um, and Mamie Eisenhower regularly attended performance at the Gettysburg Theater, often in the company of world leaders. There was a ballroom adjacent to the theater that Eisenhower used as his press conference location when he was, whenever he was in Gettysburg, and, and particularly during his recovery from his, his uh, heart attack. Uh, in the 1980s, the auditorium and the stage were converted into three little movie theaters, and there was a tremendous amount of, um, of damage, as you can see in the, in the upper slide there. Uh, the decision was made. Gettysburg College was in, involved in this, and 
they um, had uh, initiated a project to, to restore the theater, to restore the auditorium to the way it looked in 1925, but to adapt the ballroom, because you didn't need a ballroom in Gettysburg anymore, to serve a variety of purposes, including a, um, a changing art gallery for um, the college and for other organizations. The uh, 1950s marquee was, was restored. A new cafe was built uh, in the ballroom space, in part of the ballroom space, and it's called Mamie's. And a large new addition was built on the back to accommodate modern theater re requirements. And it now is a full, it has full back of the house ca capabilities as a performing arts theater. So here's a project that you, you don't establish a cutoff date and say, okay, I'm gonna restore it to 1950. You say, I'm gonna restore the auditorium to, its, to 1925. The ballroom's gonna become something else. We're gonna put a cafe in and we have a little extra space, so let's put in two, two small movie theaters, which Gettysburg very much needed. So this, this was a, a, a pretty fascinating sort of combination of preservation, conservation, uh, rehabilitation and and new new construction. And the last one I I, I want to show you is the Church of the Redeemer in in Bryn Mawr. This was designed in 1880 by Charles Burns, the noted Episcopal Church architect in the English Gothic Revival style. It sits on a the the, the church and the, the the rectory sit on a beautiful 11 acre wooded site. The exteriors uh, of the building are stone with brick and limestone detailing, slate roof. The interior of the church incorporates very finely detailed polychrome brickwork and tile and beautiful stained glass windows. This was a, this was a really a restoration project and with the addition of a very small um, wing on the right, you see it comes out perpendicularly to, to provide space for accessible restrooms and a secondary means of egress. So this, um, the, the chancel was reconfigured to, to um, satisfy modern, uh, current day liturgical requirements. The tile floor was, was, re, was restored really, or replaced based on fragments that were found. And, and all of the interior finishes were cleaned and redone and repainted um, in their original colors. And new, new lighting was installed. So this is a, this is pretty much of a, of a restoration project. Not all congregations have the resources, obviously, for such an undertaking. Partners for Sacred Places, um, an, a national organization here in, based in Philadelphia, is working, I just talked to Bob Yeager about this, is working on an innovative program to introduce small performing arts organizations without homes to churches which have ready-made and un underutilized spaces that could accommodate the programs of these smaller organizations. So I think it's a wonderful program, and Partners is a great organization, and uh, they, they, should all, they should be supported. Thanks very much, and uh, Cindy McLeod follows me with um, discussion of tax incentive projects.